morning. The uh, title of my sermon today is, Did You Fill in All the Squares? I'll explain that to you as we get along here. Many preachers today don't preach the gospel. In his second great sermon, Peter preached the gospel of Christ to the Jews of Jerusalem who had rejected Jesus as their Messiah and Savior. The last thing we need today is preachers who don't preach the gospel. The question I think we, got, we get a resounding answer to in these sermons is, can we be, can we be religious, righteous, and live right and still be lost. And I say to you this morning that it's a shame, but there are people that are living that way and are still lost. You have to realize out of all the people in Jerusalem, most of the people who rejected Jesus were the most righteous, religious, faithful people in the nation of Israel. But without Jesus, they were lost. With that question asked, I want to share with you this story. In the military, they had a term that they called square fillers. They would have a checklist of requirements, and before each requirement or inspection, inspection item, there would be printed a little square. When each requirement was completed, you would check off the appropriate squares. The term came to mean meeting Minimum requirements. You filled the squares, accomplished only what was necessary, and then it was time to do something else. This term was applied to <clears throat> when you were up for a promotion. The question asked was, did you fill all the squares? If so, then you were eligible to be promoted. Now, the reason I'm preaching this is because sometimes we as Christians, we just check off all the blocks. I know I do this myself. I think of myself, well, I did this, I did this, I went to church, I did this, I did this, I read my Bible, studied, studied the Bible, I did this, did that. And sometimes we can be just like the Pharisees and the scribes. They were square fillers. They ensured that every T was crossed and every I was dotted, but their hearts were far from God. They were outwardly righteous. They filled all the squares. They were like whitewashed tombs on the outside, but on the inside they were full of dead man's bones. If you read Matthew 23, 27, it'll tell you just that. We can't earn our way into heaven. We better try. <laughs> uh, kind of a contradiction, right? But <clears throat> we can't earn it, but we better try to earn it. Because if we're not trying, then we're not going to make it, that's for sure. Let's turn our Bibles to Acts chapter 3, starting in verse 11. We'll, just, we'll be in Acts most of, most of the sermon, so turn to Acts 3 for me. <clears throat> in Acts 3, Luke records Peter's second great sermon, and when he preached it, he really preached it, telling it how it is, but, by, but doing it with love and understanding. And that's another thing that we have to concentrate on today, is we have to concentrate on when we're preaching or we're talking to someone about the Bible, we have to do it with love and understanding. We can't always assume that that person is going to be receptive to what we're going to say. Today I want to dissect his sermon and learn the basics of the gospel for those of you who might not know for sure of your, eternal de of your eternal destiny. And also learn some things from Peter's approach. The setting for the sermon is provided us in verses 11 through 12, and that reads, <clears throat> Now, as the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them, in the porch, which is called Solomon's, which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, Men of Israel, why do you marvel with this, or why look so intently at us, as though by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The one referenced to who held on to, 
uh, to Peter and John, and that was the man that they healed. He stood with them. He was born lame, but he had been healed by faith in Jesus, verses 1 through 10. Amazed, people gathered to see and watch the spectacle of this former lame man who was now walking and leaping and praising God. According to verse 9, to Peter, a crowd was a chance to share Christ, which he did in the rest of chapter 3. Note with, the, with me first that Peter confronted these religious Jews with their main sin, and that was the scripture reading for this morning. And he let them know that they were marveling, but they needed to make changes. They needed to not just check off, check off all the squares. And I go back to the, uh, to the rich young ruler. That's exactly what the rich young ruler did. He checked off all the blocks. In fact, he told Jesus right down the line, this is what I do. I've done this for years and years and years. What would, and what did Jesus say? One thing you lack. And guess what? If we lack one thing, we can lose our place in heaven. And that's what we have to concentrate on. Let's look at Peter's outline in verse 13 and 14. He told them that they had delivered up God's Son, Jesus. That they had denied Jesus, the Holy One and Just One. That they desired a murderer, Barabbas, instead of Jesus, who was innocent and should have been free. And finally, that they had killed Jesus. Now, I want to look at this just for a moment. And I want to put myself, I know I can't do that, but I want to put myself in Jesus' place. Jesus being the most righteous man that ever walked the face of the earth in human form, let's put it that way, was given up for someone that had committed murder. Now, Jesus gave that great sacrifice for us so we can have eternal life. But he was given up for someone that had committed egregious crime. We would think we would, if we were going to put sins in a category, murder would probably be one of those ones that would be right on the top of the list. I know that there's none that's worse than others, but this man committed murder, but they murdered Jesus instead. Now, that's a scary outline if I ever saw it especially preaching it before a crowd that had demanded the crucifixion of Jesus just weeks before. What did Peter do? Peter got the point of the subject. Instead of dancing around it, he went straight to the point. As I mentioned earlier, we have to realize out of all the people in Jerusalem, most of the people who rejected Jesus were the most righteous, religious, faithful people in the nation of Israel. But when we stand before God, the question we will have to answer is not how good we were here on this earth. Because the Bible tells us in Romans that we're all sinners. We all fall short. In the end, the question will be, what did you do with my son Jesus? And I want you to think about that for a moment this morning. When we sin and we give in to the devil's temptations, we're nailing Jesus to that cross again each and every time that we do that because we rejected Jesus. What will you do with my son Jesus? Peter was trying to help them to see that their big error was their rejection of Jesus and all the changes that came with him. He referred to Jesus as the Holy One and the Just One in verse 14. These were historic facts from the long prophesied Messiah every Jew would recognize. In verse 15, Peter called Jesus the Prince of Life. The word prince here is translated author. In other places in the New Testament, and if you look at what Peter's saying, that's what he means, as the author of life, that is, the creator. Peter is affirming Jesus' deity, that he was God in the flesh and God's son. And I look of that as the prince of life is that when he was resurrected from the dead, he proved to us that we're going to be resurrected someday. We are going to be resurrected. 
and stand before God. Peter makes in everything unmistakably clear. They had killed their own Messiah. They had screamed, crucify him, crucify him. They had called for a wicked murderer to be freed, not the holy Messiah. They had committed a grievous, a grievous sin. Peter wasn't trying to convince them of what bad sinners they were, but rather focused on the magnitude of the one sin that would rob them of God's blessing, the sin of rejecting Jesus Christ and his gift of salvation. And sadly to say, we can do the same thing. We can reject that salvation. Jesus was indeed God in the flesh, and as God, he lived a sinless life. He obeyed the laws and God's commandments perfectly, but this perfect sinless one died to pay the penalty of our sins. He took our place on that cross, because that's where we belong for our sins. And unless these Jews acknowledged Jesus as their Messiah and recognized that he was God and he had died for their sins, they could not have their sins forgiven or have God's blessings. And we're in the same, same shape too if we don't do it. No matter how religious or holy or obedient or righteous they thought they were or how many squares they checked off, it didn't matter because they crucified the Son of God. Isaiah put it well in Isaiah 64, 6. But we all are like an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. And the same is true of you and me. None of us can be made right with God by religious, religion or by church attendance. By our religious works, by our obedience, by our good deeds. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. My question for us today is, what have you done with the Son of God? It matters not what good things you have done in your life or anything like that. The only thing that matters is what you have done with Jesus. Secondly, notice that Peter pointed them to Jesus as their answer in Acts 3, 16 through 18. And his name, through faith in his name, he made this man strong, whom you see and now, yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. He's talking about healing the lame man. Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance, and didn't also your, and also your rulers did. But those things would God foretold by the mouth of His prophet that the Christ would suffer. He has thus fulfilled. Peter pointed to verse 16 to the man who was healed and pointed out that it was by faith in the risen Jesus that this man had been made whole. Then Peter recognized in verse 17 that their act was not a malicious act of sheer wickedness, but was done out of ignorance. Their rejection of Jesus was a blunder, blundering act of ignorant minds. Even Jesus on the cross said in Luke 23, 34, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. But ignorance has its limits. It doesn't excuse you. In his earthly ministry, Jesus had made it clear over and over again who he was, but his audience, especially his Jew the Jewish leadership, would not believe in him. Though they had been ignorant, and even though the scriptures had predicted the ignorance and rejection, they could not be absolved of guilt. They were guilty. They even divided his garments and took lots to see who was going to get his garments. But there is good news. There's a way out. There's an answer. Notice that Peter showed them what to do to be saved in Acts 3.19. 
Repent and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that time of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Their ultimate sin was rejecting the Son of God, Jesus, as their Messiah and Savior. Peter did, didn't beat around the bush here either, but frankly told them to do two things to have their sins blotted out. Repent and be converted. It is at this point that a little explanation is required. We know that in Peter's first sermon in Acts 2.38 and also 41, he told the audience, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for remission of your sins. <clears throat> and then in 2.41 it reads, Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. From Pentecost on, when Peter preached in these two verses, they knew and were familiar with baptism. So when he made the statement in Acts 3.19, Repent, therefore, and be converted, they knew what he meant by conversion in the New Testament. It meant that they should be baptized. So some people use that verse to kind of try to get around baptism. That's why I put that in there. Now we can take this verse out of context, as I mentioned, and try to let it stand alone and try to say you're not required to be baptized to be saved and added to the Lord's church. But Peter already told his audience earlier that it was required, that we have to change and we have to do what the scripture says and be baptized. Now the sermon goes on and Peter talks about Jesus preaching to them before while here in the flesh. And then Peter goes into their history. Moses said in Deuteronomy 18.15, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brother. Him you shall hear. And that's talking about Jesus. All the prophets of the Old Testament from Samuel on foretold about things to come. Samuel said, was told by God in 1 Samuel 3.11, then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do something in Israel at which both ears of everyone who hear it will tingle. The biggest problem with those who crucified Jesus was not knowing the prophecy or their history. No, it wasn't that wasn't the biggest problem. It was not how wicked and it was how wicked and sinful they were. For they were the most religious and righteous people on earth at that time. But the Satan got into them and turned them wicked. Today, too many Christians, as they were then, are satisfied with doing the minimum requirements. They don't realize the blessings they miss out on because they've just done what they had to do as his child. What are they missing out on and how can they change? That's the question right now. <clears throat> you may be asking yourself that question. What does all this have to do with me? Well, I have to say it has a lot to do with each and every one of them. I think most people recognize that they're sinners and need God's forgiveness. They know Jesus died on the cross, but aren't quite sure they know what to do to be saved. But I have good news. There's a way out, and there's an answer. Jesus is the answer. He died on the cross for you to have an opportunity to come to him today. Think about that. If you have a need this morning to come and be baptized, we can arrange that for you. Or if you have a need to have prayers for the church to come back, please do so as we stand inside.